since the dawn of humankind, we have noticed as distinguishing characteristics our differences. We have also found the need to cling together to those around us and the things that actually unite us. Usually those things are focused on identifying features, our tribe of origin, or which team we're rooting for to win the Super Bowl. (laughs) More often than not, we notice negotiate and eventually reject those that are different from us. And this seems to be, on the whole, the collective of the human experience. Yet in this season of Epiphany, as Paul is working out in his letter to the Corinthians, the fact that unity is present and persistent, he writes these things to the church in Corinth, reminding them that it is this unity that is the identifying factor of being Christians, not division. And he writes to them and says that this unity comes solely through the power of baptism and through the death and resurrection of Jesus Christ. And I need to tell you, the Corinthians needed to be reminded about this because they were doing something that I think I can't imagine a young church that just had gotten the word and then been left on their own. I can't imagine them not doing this. And see, what they were doing was they were looking at the people who were in their community as their church, like how the world saw them. Not like how Christ sees us and we're supposed to see one another. What he was telling them, Paul was telling them, was knock it off. Stop trying to bring the world into the church. Instead, take the church out in the world. He's saying to the Corinthians, stop shaming and acting spitefully against the weak. Those who were of the lower social classes that dared to come to receive the body and blood of Jesus Christ. And also, stop thinking so highly of yourselves. Stop putting folks on pedestals Perhaps because they have certain spiritual gifts that some of you don't have. Stop giving them power and prestige in the community. That's not what Jesus was all about. Basically, stop being the world in church. Be the church in church. And he uses, in this letter to the Corinthians, something that would have been very familiar as a metaphor. That of the body. See... Again, like how the world works, politicians and philosophers use this image of the body quite a lot. Particularly, they were interested in the head. Right? Who is in charge? Who directed where to go? And particularly, they were interested in Caesar being the head. Or whoever was the mayor, whoever was the ruling person being in charge. They were the head. Everybody else was the body and did whatever the head said, right? Paul says, "Uh uh-uh. He literally turns that body hierarchy on its head. It's going to be a long one, guys. Now, what Paul's talking about is something radical and something different. That there is this unity of body. That the less honored members don't get abused but get treated with special care. That all parts of the body are essential for the body to function. Now, let me ask you, who here wants to be an eye? (laughs) Nobody. We're going to be a... Okay, a couple eyes. Who wants to be a foot? One. That's great. We're moving. All right. Who wants to be a pancreas? (laughs) Who wants to be a shin bone or an epiglottis or an armpit? Right? (laughs) All of those things are essential to the functioning of the body. All those things are necessary for the corporate body to function and be a part of. And Paul says that all of those are indeed special. Now back to 
Paul's argument about baptism being one of the big things here for the Corinthians. In baptism, we have the Spirit of God at work, which overcomes the divisions that the world wants to place upon us. In baptism, we are united not only with Christ, but with all the other members of the body, all the other bodies, all the other people that make up the body of Christ, both here in this community, but also in the world. In baptism, we are the hand that can no longer say to the foot, I don't need you. Because guess what? We do. We can no longer say that the powers of the world that seek to divide us and degrade us have any power over us. Because the world tells us we need to look at everyone else and then find out what we are not in comparison to them. In baptism, that all gets erased. We are worthy by simply the fact that we are members in corporate in the mystical body of Christ. So the lens of comparison and competition, and I'm not as good as, or I need to be better than, or I am better than, all gets shattered. Because in baptism, we are all one. Now, that, in of itself, when you think about it for about 30 seconds, will bake your noodle. It is a hugely radical idea. When was the last time anybody told you that you were as important as anybody else? When was the last time someone said to you, I find great value in you because you are you? And that the value that you bring makes us better than we could have been if you weren't here. When has anybody ever told you that? It happens so infrequently, the opposite happens all the time. You're not as good as, you need to pick up the pace for, you need to perform better than, you're on a track to go to, not you are good. You are essential. You are as necessary as everybody else to make this thing work. It's radical. And here's the thing. We have to care for everybody. Our job is to find the people who are the least among us and give them special care. If you're the most among us, great. You have a job. Go care for the least of us. If you think you're that special, go find someone who thinks they aren't special and remind them how special they are and how necessary they are. That is the job of being the church. That is our job, being the body of Christ. In short, what Paul is talking about is that there is value in the diversity of us as church. As much as we want to be like everyone else, there is value in the diverse gifts and skills and talents that we bring that are necessary. This new way of life is that diversity in the church is a gift from God. It's a new way to be church. It means unity in the midst of diversity. Now that's the new reality of what we mean to be church. And what I love about the Episcopal Church is I think that we do that as a church just about better than anybody else. I'm not going to use our diocese as an example because it's too easy. I'm going to use the diocese of Washington, our neighbors to the south. Okay? Here's the, here's the unity and diversity. They have a church there that uses the 1549 Missal Book when they celebrate Mass on Sunday morning. Vatican one, Pre-Vatican I guys are going, man, you guys are antique. And there's a church that they go from one room to another and literally dance. Episcopalians dancing to the Eucharistic table. That's in the same diocese. And everybody's viewed as important, as necessary, as expressions of who we are as the church. We have people in this church who are come from all different backgrounds. We have people in this church who come from all different ways of being. We have people in this church, we got people who are begging for the wall, and we are people who want the borders to be completely open, but you know what happens? We all come and kneel down at this altar rail and receive the body and blood of our Lord and Savior, Jesus Christ, 
because we are one. Where else will you find in the world that unity amongst that kind of diversity? Nowhere but the church. The body of Christ here at St. Martin's is made up of those various members, those various parts. And God has arranged the body here at St. Martin's And that means that each member here is important as well and vital. God has brought new members to our church in this past year, even this past week. And my message to them is that God has plans for you, like God has plans for people who have been coming to church here since 1954. Our job is to discover what that plan is. How are the collection of people who are here, who have brought what they are the unique members, the shin bones and armpits of the body, how the things that you all have brought here to be used now for what God is calling us to be here as the body of Christ. Paul says this, it's all about you. You are the body of Christ. And each one of you is an important member of that body. And we have an obligation to our other members. Everyone has an obligation. No matter if it's your first Sunday or you've been coming here since forever, we are all obligated to take action. To be moved to change. To change the world. You can't get out of it. You were baptized into this body, remember? There are people at your baptism who said, we will support you in your new life in Christ. That new life in Christ means you get to be with us now for forever. You're stuck with us. But we are called to change. God never said to anybody, hey, stay right there and don't do anything. You will not see Jesus ever going to people and saying, you know what? Chill out. Just stay right here. Don't do a thing. Keep doing what you're doing. It's going to be okay. No. Jesus says go. He sends the disciples out two by two. He sends 70 of them out two by two to go change the world, go preach the good news. Go heal the sick. Go be with the poor. Go visit those in prison. Go change the world. Not because we are one body, but because we bring different gifts to that one body, we can go and change the world in many, many, many different ways. Good news about that is that the world is always, always presenting to us, the church, ways that we can take the body of Christ and put it into action to help change the world to be a better place, to help change the world to see more clearly the inbreaking of the kingdom of God, which is you all, by the way. I saw that this week. I randomly turned on the television. I don't usually watch the news, but I got up early one morning. I said, let's turn on a morning CNN and see what's going on in the world. And I heard about a church that was nearby here uh, during the shutdown. And they decided to go ahead and give away $50 gift cards to anybody with a government ID because they knew people needed groceries. And what they were going to do is give to each person. And when they saw how long the line was, they decided, um, we're just going to give 50 bucks to each family. Is that okay? It'll go farther. They ran out of gift cards in like 16 minutes. And they weren't able to accommodate what was going on. That is the type of action in the world that we're talking about. Where people come to find the good news, to get some relief from what the world beats down on them with. To be able to eat, to be with their family, to wash their clothes, whatever it is they need to get done. That is our job. And it comes because we all think and see the world in different ways. And that, my brothers and sisters, is part of that holy diversity. If you're a shin bone, you see the world at shin bone level. If you're an ear, you see the world at ear level. You see different things in the world that need to be done. And our job is to report back as the body what this body, us, can do in that world that will help alleviate how the world sees things and help us to bring the kingdom of God here and close. And that holy diversity is, in the end, the remedy for falling into the comfortableness of complacency. 
My question to us this morning is, how is the Spirit of God calling you, my brothers and sisters, now in this moment, to some kind of change? How is the Spirit of God calling St. Martin's to be more than we ever have been, using our diverse, unique gifts as the body of Christ and to the glory of God? All of us are important. All of us have an obligation to others, to our brothers and sisters in Christ, those baptized in the Spirit who are part of our community and indeed part of our larger body of Christ. We and they have a role to play. They may be a patella or an armpit or the knee, but they're an armpit, a patella, or a knee just like you and just like me. Our job is to take this body and to go out into the world to change it for Christ. Amen.